History of the Copa Room at the Sands. In 1952, the Sands Hotel and Casino was built as the seventh resort casino on the Strip. The Sands had an all-star cast of executives, including Vice President Jack and Trotter, who was one of the original owners and entertainment director. When Sands President Jack Friedman died six years later, and Trotter became president. Jack was a 240-pound charismatic former nightclub bouncer who was credited with discovering or bringing to fame Frankie Lane, Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin, and Johnny Ray, among others, which helped him get the nickname Mr. Entertainment. And Trotter was also considered the nightclub king of New York City because he was a partial owner and general manager of the Copacabana nightclub in New York before opening the Sands in 1952. And Trotter wanted to replicate what he did in New York City, so the Copa Room is designed and named after the Copacabana, and it was a lavish 385-seater, opulently decorated, in a Brazilian carnival motif. Guests could buy food and drink, but there was no cover charge and no minimum purchase required until three years later in 1955. Seats were hard to come by for the shows that were every night, usually at 8 p.m. and midnight, but sometimes there was a third show. Jack said at the Sands Grand Opening, I want to bring in new productions, top names, new talent, and surround the shows with the best supporting acts, and of course the most beautiful showgirls in the world. Danny Thomas was the opening act in December 1952, but when he got sick during the first week, several headliners replaced him. After the grand opening, Billboard's Bill Smith claimed that the Sands was already the country's top act spot, and he was amazed at how good the second and third tier entertainers were at the casino. The Sands opening week roster of entertainers was as good as the entire list from the other strip resorts. Before the Sands came along, there was an informal agreement among the strip hotels that they would not steal each other's top entertainers. But Jack and Trotter started a bidding war for the top talent that all the resorts, including the Sands, would later regret. And Trotter was able to offer top talent an ownership stake in the Sands if they worked enough days. Many shows on the Strip in the early 1950s had no cover charge and no minimum food and drink purchase because people had to walk through the casino to get to the showrooms. But some Strip resorts lost money because they paid too much to attract top talent while there wasn't enough gambling revenue coming in. The top stars were loyal to Entrotter because Jack gave them high salaries and luxurious facilities. Jerry Lewis said, He was our love. We wouldn't go anywhere in Vegas but where Jack was. John Gunther said, Jack and Trotter is responsible for the transformation of Las Vegas from a little desert village to a town boiling over with glamour. Sometimes entertainers took less money to perform at the Copa Room because they could demand more money around the country if they had played at the Copa. Jack and Trotter brought his famous Copa girls from the Copacabana to the Sands and they were advertised as the most beautiful girls in the West. <laughs> Fashion and beauty is what a Copa girl was known for, and they were elegant ladies, proud and wholesome. Sometimes they wore elaborate outfits that were very expensive. And Trotter personally met every Copa girl that he hired, 
and insisted that the girls have no show business experience because he wanted that fresh American girl look. At one audition, only one girl was selected out of 500. At another audition in Los Angeles, he picked three girls, and when he was told that the three girls couldn't dance that well, he replied, I don't care if they never dance. They're beautiful, and I want beauty. Usually the Copa girls would visit with the audience after the show, not during the show. Jack and Trotter had a celebration in 1957 when he paid out his one millionth dollar to a Copa girl. In 16 years, one in 11 girls were chosen at auditions. 72 girls from the Sands went on to get Hollywood contracts. The average employment was seven months at $125 a week. Foreign Trotter, the perfect Copa girl, was five foot four, 116 pounds, 32 to 34 bust, 24 waist, 34 hip, a face with small features that has the American girl look, and usually black hair. The audition ads stated, all you need be is beautiful. There were Miss Atomic Bomb pageants during the nuclear bomb testings of the 1950s, and Copa Girl Lee Merlin was the last and most famous Miss Atomic Bomb in 1957. They had a very nice little lounge there as well, because I remember after the show had finished, you could go in this lounge where the Bob Sims trio used to play and have a drink there, and Sinatra would be at the next table and Count Basie and um, Dean Martin, and you'd just run into people like that all the time. And they always had a wonderful atmosphere. Wherever they were, you kind of felt someone was there, like when Sinatra walked into a room. I mean, you kind of knew that room had been walked into, so to speak. And Sammy Davis was tremendous. I mean, he used to like our show, and he saw our show when he'd finished his one night and invited the whole company to have supper with him afterwards and took the whole cast, you know. And he spoke with everyone in the company. He came around to each person and made you feel part of it, you know. It was like a family. We were like a family in those days. It was an occasion when you went out. Everyone dressed. We, we went to work in the shows, and we went in and out through the stage doors, of course, but we always wore, like, a nice cocktail dress and heels, and because everyone dressed like that. If we'd have dressed like they dress now, we'd have stuck out like a sore thumb, and it wouldn't have been too welcome. At the age of 37, Frank Sinatra made his Sands debut in 1953. My heart's on fire. And the fire gets higher, I will weather the storm. What do I care how much it might storm? I forgot my love, back the love. I forgot my love to keep me. When Sinatra performed making $15,000 a week, Hollywood stars would fly in for the shows and the audience was filled with high rollers. When Sinatra left, the big stars and high rollers would leave town. Frank's cousin Ray Sinatra was the first musical director for The Sands, and in 1954, Antonio Morelli became the musical director and orchestra conductor. Jack and Trotter wanted someone who was good, but not too good. Popular, but not popular enough to outshine the featured performers. Easy to work with, but no pushover. The president of the Musicians Union of Las Vegas said, playing the sands was the pinnacle of an entertainer's career. Only the best musicians were in Morelli's orchestra. Antonio Morelli worked to bring classical music to the community by establishing a series of community concerts that Vegas headliners would also perform at. From the community concerts, Morelli founded the Las Vegas Pops that would become the Las Vegas Philharmonic in 1998. The Morellis built a custom home at the Desert Inn Country Club Estates. Sometimes the Rat Pack would rehearse at the home and there were many Copa Room show after parties that included the Rat Pack, Nat King Cole, and Judy Garland, among others. The Junior League of Las Vegas preserved the historic home 
and moved it downtown for use as their headquarters. This is one of the oldest structures that has a connection to the Las Vegas Strip and tours are available. In 1957, Sammy Davis Jr. started playing at the Copa Room and he was known as the greatest entertainer in the world. Why can't I fall in love just like any other man? And maybe then I know what kind of Not only could Sammy sing, but he could do impressions. Well, Jello again. It's me. Hmm. But really, ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be in Las Vegas once again. And he was a pretty good dancer. Also in 1957, Dean Martin performed for the first time as a solo act. Multiple stars were in the audience, including Desi Arnaz, Lucille Ball, Jack Benny, Phil Harris, and Debbie Reynolds. When you're drinking, when you're drinking, the show looks good to you. When you're drinking, you get thinking it helps your point of view but when you're sober the skies all seem gray yeah when you're sober life's a pain so good drinking that's what I'm thinking cause it's what I in 1957, burlesque king Harold Minsky brought the topless production show called Follies to Las Vegas at the Dunes. Minsky would dress the girls in hat and shoes and display the figure in the full majesty of a plush Parisian show. By 1958, three casinos on the west side of the Strip had nude shows and they were very popular. The East Siders, which included the Sands, who had big money in stars and fully costumed girl shows, launched a campaign against West Side indecency. Jack and Trotter had some points of discussion that he would use for his campaign. Number one, since 1952, we have spent a lot of time and money to make Las Vegas the entertainment capital of the world. Number two, Las Vegas is a privileged phenomenon. Number three, business-wise, nude shows will soon show themselves to be just a flash in the pan. Number four, why should these young kids from nice families work their heads off on the same stage with a group of girls whose only talent is pulling their brassiere string? Number five, we've been warning against the nude shows for a year now. Number six, it will still have to be up to the public and the press to get across to the legislators and to the operators of resort hotels in such a privileged industry that good taste and good public relations are more important than filling a showroom by any method. The Bishop of Reno banned the nude shows for all Catholics in Nevada. And the bishop wrote a letter that was read in all Nevada Catholic churches that week, which read in part, it seems to be unhappily true that new lows are being reached and that the agents responsible are throwing all scruples aside in appealing to the very worst in man's animal appetites. It is even more horrible to think that our young people should be exposed to such influences, if not by spectators, then by way of advertising and common talk. Despite the campaign against nude shows on the Strip, the nude shows were here to stay and eventually the Sands would have nude shows 
including the Bear Essence show. Dean Martin was headlining at the Copa on January 28, 1959, when Frank Sinatra joined him on stage for the first time. A reviewer reported that the pair put on one of the best shows ever seen at the Sands. Until 1960, the Las Vegas casinos were segregated, and some called Las Vegas the Mississippi of the West. The barriers toppled slowly, with a little help from the city's powerful black entertainers. My heart cooks like a turkey dinner, baby, you come on Faster than a derby winner when you go You leave them all at the post If a black performer had more than one show, the black performer would have to wait in a room or area between shows. They couldn't go to the bar, restaurant, or casino to hang out. And these areas would usually be back rooms, or storage rooms with a chair and maybe a table. Sands performer Harry Belafonte was allowed to stay overnight at the hotel but was not allowed in the casino. One night around 3 a.m. after his shows, Belafonte walked up to a blackjack table and put his money down. The dealer hesitated, looked up at the surveillance camera, and then gave Harry Belafonte some chips. A crowd gathered to watch the handsome Calypso singer, not particularly intrigued by the game, but simply to see what had once been unimaginable, the first black man to play cards on the Las Vegas Strip. Frank Sinatra used his power to help black people in Vegas because, as a kid in New York City, Sinatra was called Italian slurs that really hurt him. In fact, he was among the earliest and most visible proponents of civil rights in all of show business. A wonderful man, and in his time when he was working, he's now retired, living a life of Riley, Irving Riley. <laughs> Mr. Sammy Davis Sr. sitting down here. Butter on a table. In 1958, Sammy Davis told Jack and Trotter that he must allow his father and uncle to stay at the Sands Hotel while he is performing. Jack obliged, but and Trotter continued to not allow other black people to stay at the hotel. On March 26, 1960, black leaders got together with city and state officials at the off-strip casino Moulin Rouge which was the only integrated casino. They agreed to make the strip officially integrated. Despite Frank Sinatra's strong support for black people, including Sammy Davis, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin continued to deliver racial remarks at Sammy Davis on the Copa Room stage. Well, it's better than eating pizza every night. Yeah, but we don't have to spit out the crust. <laughs> Lamb food. If we don't want to. Hey, why don't you have a little snack? What is it? Yeah, we'll have a little here. <laughs> All right, folks, put on your sheets and we'll start the meeting. Oh, come on. Go bore a few holes in that and be somebody. Hey, hey, Zelda, look, Zelda. I'll go out and I'll drink with you. I'll go pick cotton with you. I'll eat oranges with you. I'll go to shoe with you, but I don't touch you. <laughs> Have you forgotten the South? <laughs> I'm trying to, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but Sammy also contributed to the racial jokes. My heart, Sam. Sam. Sam! Sam! What? What? I didn't mean to move in the neighborhood. I won the house in a raffle. Yeah, sure. From the Elk Club. In the late 1950s, Frank Sinatra bought the filming rights to Ocean's Eleven, and Frank got all his friends together 
to make the film in Vegas. Frank chose his singing buddies Dean Martin and Sammy Davis, added lead actor Peter Lawford and comedian Joey Bishop to the Ocean's Eleven cast, and these five men would come to be known as the Rat Pack. Although early on, their friends called the five men the Clan, But that name never caught on because of the KKK. It wasn't until the 1980s that people started calling the group the Rat Pack, and Sinatra did not like that name. You three guys, sometimes called the Rat Pack. How do you feel about the term now that it's been a few years since it was first applied, and how did it come about? Oh, What's that's the end of the question was a very a big a good point. I was going to bring that up, by the way, before anybody used that stupid phrase again. <laughs> it, it's now... The Rat Pack was made of uh, Humphrey Bogart, who started it all, yeah. and uh, several other people who lived in the... Uh, the small area here in Beverly Hills, and they de they decided that they would be called the Rat Pack. And then uh, one day somewhere, Sammy opened his big mouth that we were members of the Rat Pack, and that's what happened. That's really what started the whole thing. We've we've never discussed a, a term for the three of us. During the 1960s, they were not known as the Rat Pack. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Martin. And Mrs. Sinatra present their sons, the Drunk Singers. And here he is for your enjoyment, the first drunkard, direct from the bar, Dean Martin. Sands publicity director Al Freeman came up with the idea to put all five men together on the Copa Room stage at night while they were filming Ocean's Eleven during the day. Comedian Joey Bishop wrote most of the comedy bits for the musical comedy show, and Sinatra called him the hub of the big wheel. Bishop, who was one of the top comics during that era, usually played the straight man, allowing the three big stars to get the laughs. Joey Bishop and Dean Martin were also the only ones who could make jokes at Sinatra's expense. Actor Peter Lawford was most likely part of the Rat Pack because he was John F. Kennedy's brother-in-law and Frank's nickname for Peter was Brother and Lawford. Sinatra wanted nothing more than to be close friends with JFK and Frank used Peter Lawford to get to JFK and Peter knew that. The Rat Pack musical comedies in the Copa Room during Ocean's Eleven filming was called The Summit at the Sands or The Summit. There were two shows each night at 8 p.m. and midnight. The first night of the summit was on January 20, 1960, but there was no Ocean's Eleven filming that day. A typical show started with comedian Joey Bishop opening with some jokes. Dean Martin would sing first, followed by Frank Sinatra, and then Sammy Davis. Then they would wheel out a drink cart on stage and joke about anything, including race, religion, politics, women, and drinking. We'll have one more look at the body, then we'll close the lid. The dinner show cost about $5, and seats were very difficult to get. Here, I'll, uh, I'll make one for you, and later you make one for me, huh? Are you talking about broads or no, a drink? No, drinking, drinking. Oh, I'm not about drinking. You kind of hesitated there for a moment. <laughs> Boy, you want a little of this? You want a little of this, a little of that? Drink never hurt nobody. <laughs> I like the wonderful words of Mr. Joey Lewis. He said, you're not drunk if you can lay on the floor without holding on. Do whatever you have to do. Good. Every afternoon. How about a toast? A toast? A toast. All right. Where the hell have you been? You can get high watching this show. Hi, Lum. Hey, Toast. That's right, you drink during the toast. The greatest love, the love of love, greater than that of brother for brother, is the tender, passionate, infinite love of one drunken bum for another.
When was the last time you was cut by a colored fella? Would that make me Jewish? going down to the mystic night that I see Laura there, and we're going to talk to a few people. Hey, if, if all, all the women in Texas were as ugly as your mama, the Lone Ranger is going to be alone for a long time. Yeah. During the summit, they would introduce famous people who were in the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob the host. On Sunday, February 7, 1960, Senator John F. Kennedy flew to Vegas for some time off from his presidential campaign, and Kennedy knew where the party was, the Summit at the Sands. We are also, huh? we are also delighted to have in our audience the brightest, you get the feeling we don't need broads, what are you, sick or something? The brightest man in the political world in this country or any other country today. And I personally feel I'm going to visit him in that house one day very soon. I'm going to be in the outhouse. <laughs> Senator John Kennedy from the great state of Massachusetts. Yeah, John. With Vegas mob stories in the press and with the summit, the American people knew that the place to be in 1960 was Las Vegas Boulevard and the Sands. Everyone wanted to see for themselves what Las Vegas was all about. Every strip hotel was sold out during the summit. Pam Gortler said, Those few weeks in the 1960s was pure magic. With all the publicity that ensued, those weeks defined the image of Las Vegas in the minds of the nation. During February, the Sands Hotel received 18,000 reservation requests for its 200 hotel rooms. James Kaplan said, 1960 was the year Las Vegas popped. Right now. In 1961, the Sands Hotel turned down the opportunity to host the Nevada competition for the Miss Universe pageant because the Copa Room was so popular. Promotion director Al Freeman replied by letter saying, 
Our schedule is so heavy with special shows and TV work that the management here feels that we should pass up the Nevada franchise for your fine pageant. The Rat Pack shows at the Copa Room lasted about three years because on November 22, 1963, Sinatra's friend, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Then, less than a month later, on December 8th, Frank's 19-year-old son was kidnapped in Lake Tahoe. The kidnappers were caught. The Rat Pack continued to perform from time to time, but the show was never the same because of the mood of the country and Frank Sinatra. On November 27, 1964, Frank Sinatra performed with Count Basie and his orchestra. This one-time dinner show, starting at 8.30 p.m., was seen by many celebrities, including Lucille Ball and Edward G. Robinson. Count Basie was the first black musician to win a Grammy Award, and he won nine Grammys. This 1964 show was one of the biggest shows in Copa Room history. Two years later, starting on January 9, 1966, Frank Sinatra and Count Basie performed for four weeks at the Copa, and they would record a live album. Frank said that it was probably the most exciting engagement I have ever done in my life. On September 6, 1967, the Apollo 7 astronauts and their backup crew visited the Copa Room to watch Frank Sinatra. The Apollo 7 crew was the first to orbit the Earth about a year later, which made it possible to land on the moon soon after. Three, two, we have ignition. Commit liftoff. We have liftoff. Also in 1967, Howard Hughes bought the Sands during his buying spree of strip hotels. Howard hated Sinatra, and the feelings were mutual, in part because Hughes wanted to marry movie star Ava Gardner, who he had dated, but instead she married Sinatra. Hughes wanted to get rid of Frank, so he put a credit limit on his gambling, which Frank never had. Sinatra confronted the normally mild-mannered casino manager, Carl Cohen, about his new credit limit, and eventually Carl had enough and punched Frank in the face. The New York Times reported that Frank Sinatra walked out of his contract with the Sands Hotel here last night because the management cut off his credit. Frank said that he would never perform in Vegas again, but he started performing at Caesars Palace soon after leaving the Sands. Dean Martin had already left the Sands shortly after Howard Hughes became the owner by signing a deal with the Riviera, and with Sinatra going to Caesars Palace, this is when the Copa Room began to lose its reputation as the greatest stage in show business. In 1973, Wayne Newton began appearing at the Copa Room. According to David Schwartz, people have said he probably was the entertainer who consistently sold out the Copa Room or wherever he was playing more than anybody else in Vegas history.
The Pratt brothers bought the Sands Hotel in 1981, and on June 25th of that year, the Copa Room closed to be remodeled as a day lounge, and it reopened in January of 1982 with the show Top Secret. But that change didn't go so well, and they closed the Copa Room again three months later and made it a headliner showroom again. Also in 1982, the Sands changed their marquee to a bigger reader board and a more safe corporate script. The Copa Room continued to draw top talent into the 1990s, including Mary Wilson. Sheldon Adelson bought the Sands in 1989, and in 1996, the Sands announced that the hotel would be closing for good to make way for the Venetian Resort. Well, I guess that's it, folks. <laughs> the last Copa Room performances was Viva Las Vegas in the afternoon show and comedian John Panette at night. Tickets were fifteen ninety five per person. You know, the Venetian is built on the land on which the fabled Sands Hotel stood. The Copa Room, the birthplace of the Rat Pack. When I took over the Sands, I felt that I was taking over a piece of nostalgia and a piece of Americana. But when I saw the Mirage go up across the street, I mean, these mega resorts were so competitive and so compelling for visitors. And the theming of these resorts sort of obsoleted and passed by the resorts of yesteryear. By superimposing a map of the Venetian over one of the sands, it turns out that the fabulous Copa Room of the famous Sands Hotel was right here, where the Great Hall of the Venetian is today. A longtime Copa Room Mater D said, I wouldn't give you two cents for Vegas today. If I came into Vegas today, I think I would leave the next day. It's not Vegas anymore. I don't know what it is. Outside the Venetian are some footprints where each member of the Rat Pack approximately stood when they took their iconic photo during the filming of Ocean's Eleven. Because of all the performers that played at the Sands, including the Rat Pack, the Copa Room is the one location most responsible for giving Las Vegas the reputation as the entertainment capital of the world. Not a soul can bust this team in two. We stick together like glue. And when it's sleeping time, that's when we ride. We start to swing, swing to the sky. Listen, Bobby. <laughs> they, they ring. Uh, a ding, ding. I feel no years in. And I repeat what I said and at the start. They'll need a big crowbar to bust the fire. All alone, but far from blue. Oh. Before we get finished, we'll make the town roar. We'll start out at Jilly's right after the shore. Life is gonna be a wee while. 